enginemanship and the learning of enginemanship could be seen as a kind of discipleship at the feet of this machine. You have a driver who has all the knowledge and all the learning and all the skills. You have his disciple who's the fireman who's at his feet learning these skills. And the fireman in the process of producing steam and power for the driver's hand is actually performing a form of alchemy. He's combining the elements of earth, coal, air, oxygen and water. And with the magic of his skills, he's producing the power that drives this machine along. Victoria Station, London. Until the mid-50s, most long-distance travel in Britain was made by express train from stations like this. From 1948, this Battle of Britain class loco hauled crack express trains for British Rail's southern region. It was operated by engine drivers like Clive Groom. The engine is almost bursting with steam. I'm going to start it away without slipping if I can. I've got power to unleash here through this lever. The guard has just given me the tip. And with luck, we'll start away without slipping. I'm unleashing very destructive powers here. If I do it wrong, within 100 seconds, the engine will flash itself to pieces. It's amazing power in these things. The amazing power in these 128-ton locos allowed speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. In the cab, or footplate as it's known, the driver and his fireman enjoyed one of the classic working relationships. I'm looking to him when the signals are his side. I'm looking to him to provide the steam when I need it. He's doing his job, I'm doing my job, but I'm reliant on him totally for what I've got under here. Got a green pie. Right. You couldn't be a driver if you couldn't fire an engine because you couldn't supervise your fireman if you didn't know what he should be doing. Though it looks like simple shoveling, the firing of a loco requires great skill to maintain steam pressure. The pressure has to be such that you've got power under the regulator when you need it, and the heat of the steam, which is called superheat, depends on the colour of the fire. So we can get 750 degrees Fahrenheit in the steam if we've got 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit in the fire. It all depends on him. I'm listening to the feet of the engine. I'm listening to the rail joints for my speed. I don't necessarily rely on the speedometer up there. In fact, in the early days, we had no speedos. We did it all by sound. I can tell when the engine's picking up its water. I can tell by smell when the engine is superheating. There's a nutty smell from the oil in the front end when the engine's superheating. And the reaction to the controls is like a supercharged car. The locos that Clive Groom drove were specially designed for the Southern Railway. On the London North Eastern Railway, Flying Scotsman was one of a fleet built from 1922 to haul passenger express trains from London's King's Cross to Edinburgh. With three cylinders and enormous boilers, they should have been Britain's fastest locos. But early models were dogged by poor steaming. The Scotsman's designer, Nigel Gresley, found a solution in the engine of a rival railway, the Great Western.
This is Castle Class Loco Defiant. It was a type designed in 1923 to haul express trains for the Great Western Railway. The Castle Class represents for me the epitome of locomotive design of the time. And of course, they look nice, as the taper boiler and all the brass work and copper work, which in itself doesn't do anything for a locomotive's performance, but certainly sets them off. And their performance, the records that they set up, particularly on the Cheltenham Flyer, the whole thing just comes together as a, as a splendid piece of machinery. I think they're wonderful. Footplate crews on God's Wonderful Railway, as GWR was known to its loyal fans, thought their engines were wonderful too, which was a good job because crew comfort was rather a low priority. There was little weather protection and no seats. But there were some compensations. By modern standards, or by later standards, the castles are a bit spartan. They're relatively straightforward to drive. They're very responsive to both the fireman and the driver. And they were very fast. And one of the advantages of the castle was that it kept its good riding characteristics even when it was fairly warm. The good riding was a result of great engineering at GWR Swindon Works. This king-class loco was designed by Charles Collett, who was also responsible for the castles. When Collett built the castles, he introduced an optical alignment system into Swindon Works, uh, which enabled them to reduce the tolerances on all the moving parts to the very bare minimum. And as a result, of course, they started off with a considerable advantage over those built in other railways. It is said that at that time, Swindon scrapped locomotives or put them in for a major overhaul at, to at wear, wear tolerances that um, the London Northeastern turned out as new. It was this spirit of railway rivalry that contributed to Nigel Gresley's understanding of the steaming problem in his own Flying Scotsman. In 1924, at the Wembley Empire Exhibition, the best of the Great Western stood in the Palace of Engineering near the beautiful but still technically flawed Flying Scotsman. And the two stood side by side in the Exhibition Hall, beautifully presented, of course, all gleaming and polished. And people remarked that although the Great Western had said, quite truthfully, that the castle was the most powerful locomotive in Britain, it was a very much smaller in appearance than Flying Scotsman. And I think the result of this was to sharpen the minds of the railway fraternity in particular. The two railways swapped locos for running trials, and the smaller castle trounced Gresley's engine. However, the real winners were Gresley and the LNER. Gresley studied the superior steam circuit of the castle, and with this knowledge transformed his own already good engines into a 20th century legend. The 4472 Flying Scotsman is the sole survivor of a fleet of 52 which heralded a new era of big engines and high-speed running. In 1927, the LNER began non-stop trial runs from London to Newcastle. Main lines were equipped with water troughs between the tracks to refill tenders without stopping. So, when she approaches a water trough, Watch Farman Mungo doing his stuff. Farman Mungo's stuff was this. During the journey, he would lower a scoop into the six or seven hundred yard trough. At speeds of up to 70 miles per hour, around 3,000 gallons would be rammed into the tender in 15 seconds. But really long non-stop runs, say to Edinburgh, would raise a new problem, crew fatigue. No driver of trains is more proud of his Scottish descent than MacLeod. Now beyond York, the Scots crew prepare to relieve the strain on the English pair. Gresley's simple but effective idea was to allow a relief crew from the train to walk through an 18-inch wide corridor in the coal tender and onto the footplate. On May the 1st, 1928, 
four crews worked two trains in opposite directions between King's Cross and Edinburgh. At nearly 400 miles, it was to become the world's longest scheduled non-stop run. Leaving from King's Cross at 10 a.m. every morning, the Flying Scotsman provided services on board that became a benchmark for luxury rail travel. But for Nigel Gresley, it was just the beginning. Determined to develop engines with higher speeds and better fuel economy, his masterpiece was yet to come. Silver Jubilee train, latest streamline wonder of the LNER, leaves King's Cross on her record-making trial run. Nigel Gresley created this streamlined masterpiece to celebrate the King of England's reign in 1935. Seventeen years later, driver Jack Taylor reminisced about the day he broke the world speed record for steam. The Silver Link was the finest engine I ever rode upon. I didn't know accurately what speed we were doing. They had a speed recording machine in one of the coaches behind. I judged it to be about 90 miles an hour. Just beyond Biggleswade, Mr. Gridley comes through the corridor and shouts in my ear, Ease your arm, young man. Do you know you touch 112 twice? Go a bit easier. It was completely different to the teak trains which the LNER had produced for the Flying Scotsman and everything previously. It was coloured in silver and the external uh, effect of the train was totally different to the normal train that was running on the LNER at the time. It charged a supplement, I think, of five shillings for people to travel on above the normal fare and the supplements covered the cost of the construction of the train in a very short time. The streamlined trains were put on to give business people in Newcastle originally a day in London to do some work and return the same day. At the launch of the Silver Jubilee service, Peter Townend was only 10. But 20 years later, he was to find himself in charge of Top Shed, the King's Cross depot that kept nearly 150 locos on the rails. The Sir Nigel Gresley was one of them. Named after its designer who was knighted in 1936 for services to British industry, it is known as an A4 Pacific. In the mid-1930s, the fad for futuristic streamlining was at fever pitch. Most was a victory of form over function. Not only were the A4s aerodynamically successful, but they helped solve the engine driver's nightmare, drifting smoke. We must be able to see the signals <coughs> ahead down the long boiler. His vision isn't very good at the best of times, but you can't see anything if the smoke is beating across from the side wind and obscuring the view from the cab. In the belief that the streamlined shape would help lift the smoke clear of the cab, Nigel Gresley tried different shaped models in a wind tunnel. But nothing worked until Eric put his finger on the problem. The technical assistant, Eric Bannister, who was involved in the experiment, was actually holding a plasticine model in his hand and he held it with his thumb behind the chimney and made a depression behind the chimney by mistake and they put the model in the wind tunnel and found for the first time they'd succeeded in lifting the smoke clear of the cab. The cab of the Gresley locomotive was extremely comfortable for the driver and the fireman 
compared to many other companies where the cab was rather austere, but you could drive the A4 from a sitting position, all the controls within the driver's reach, and um, the fireman was provided also with a bucket seat. And with a wide firebox locomotive, you don't need to fire the locomotive continuously. For the next two years, Gresley's streamlined A4s dominated speed records until arch rivals, the London, Midland and Scottish, rolled this out in time for the 1937 coronation. It was one of the most powerful locos ever built in Britain. Designed by William Stanier, the 165-ton loco coronation commenced a publicity-seeking trial run from Euston to Crewe on June the 29th, 1937. 100 journalists and railway officials took part in a test run from Euston to Crewe and back that provided such an orgy of speed as has never before been indulged in over LMS metals. From 85 miles an hour, the speed rose quickly to 100, faster yet and faster, eating up the miles. 102, 105, 108, and she's still accelerating. The rhythm of the exhaust grows stronger, faster. 112.5 miles an hour for two miles, smoothly surging over the metals. A supreme effort, and Coronation has done it. 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. This, then, was the contribution of the London, Midland, and Scottish Railway to this great Coronation year. A contribution that gives daily service to the nation, a tangible, living contribution, exemplifying the spirit of the age. They reach 114 miles an hour, but of course it's not the high speed so much, it's braking from high speed that is the problem, and they had serious difficulty in stopping in crew station and went through reverse curves at 50 miles an hour that were intended by the engineer to be passed through at 25, and nearly, it's a, it's a wonder they didn't derail the train. Speed records mesmerised the 1930s public and inevitably had led to reckless running. For all its down-dare spaceship looks and go-faster stripes, Stanier's streamlining had little aerodynamic value and it got in the way of essential maintenance. Within 10 years, the outer casings were scrapped. All that remains of these good-looking locos in their original form are these fragments on film. Even their record didn't last long. Just over a year later, on July the 3rd, 1938, the LNER challenged the speed record with a loco named after a duck. With my lovely blue streamlined engine mallard, I accelerated up the bank to Stoke Summit and passed Stoke Box at 85. Once over the top, I gave mallard a red. After three miles, the speed meter in my cab showed 107 miles an hour. Then, 108, 109, 110, Getting near Silver Jubilee's record of 113, wonder if I can get past that. And before I knew it, the needle was at 116, and we got the record. They told me afterwards there was a deal of excitement in that dynamometer car. Go on, old girl, I thought, we can do better than this. And shot through a little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, while they tell me the folks in the car held their breath, 126 miles per hour. 126, my mate, Tommy Bray, you've done it, you blighter. The blighters on Mallard's footplate had done it. Flashing through the English countryside, they set a world record for steam forever and turned Mallard and themselves into national heroes. Yes, I've driven many important trains, but never with the thrill I got on the 3rd of July, 1938, when for Mallard and me, the world really did go by. It went by like a flash. War ended the thrilling years of the speed records, and afterwards the A4s became the property of the newly nationalised railway system. 
Through the austerity years of the 1950s, steam was still cheaper than diesels. But the tide was turning, and the threat to Gresley's magnificent A4s came from this. The engines in these 1936 Junkers are diesels. 30 years later, English Electric adapted the Luftwaffe engine for rail traction. In the black and white world of 1955, the sky blue diesel Deltic was the shock of the new. This is the prototype outside the Vulcan engineering works where it was built. At 3,300 horsepower, there was nothing else that remotely, as a production type, came anywhere near it. They're an interesting machine to drive because of the amount of power that you've got at hand. They're unique in the fact that they're fitted with two diesel engines and generators. They were the only production class of diesel electric locomotive built with two engine and generator sets. The good thing about the driving position in a Deltic is the all-round good visibility, which you didn't really have on steam. Twenty-two Deltics replaced 55 steam locos hauling express trains up the east coast. The Deltics brought an end to an era that had lasted 150 years. What a contrast the clean diesel electric makes compared with the old smoky coal-burning locos. For a while, the smoky coal-burning locos shared Britain's railways with the new diesels. The southern region of British Railways ran these light Pacifics until 1967. But all that remains now are the much-loved survivors and the memories of the men who drove the cream of Britain's fast trains. The expense of the machinery that was put into the hands of these quite simple, unlettered men was extraordinary. The locomotives were not only lethal, they travelled at quite considerable speeds, they cost an awful lot to build, and the men in charge had no one to supervise them. They were the largest body of unsupervised men in the country. Some 70,000 drivers and firemen at one time. The first time I went uh, at a considerable rate, I thought my last hour had come. But then I thought to myself it was a bloody fine way to die and uh, resign myself to death. Next Monday in the final programme, Classic Trains looks at the contribution of the freight carriers. And a book of the series is now available, price £17.99.